William mm. is a senior research fellow for, this is a wonderful title, for <laughs> university design and director of research for the New American University in the office of the president at Arizona State University. And I'm sure many of you know Arizona State University has been doing some of the most innovative things uh, um, among American public uh, research universities. Uh, uh, William is also an associate research professor, and this is another wonderful title in the School of Historical, Philosophical, and Religious Studies and an affiliate scholar in the Consortium for Science, Policy, and Outcomes. Um, before he uh, went to Arizona State University, he was at the University of Southern California. He spent some time at the University of California, Santa Barbara, also at the Getty Research Institute, and he's a consultant for the Getty, Getty and as a consultant for the Getty Conservation Institute and the University of Colorado Boulder and he got his PhD in history from UCLA. So we're very pleased to have him here today. And I'm very pleased to be having a conversation with him about this book, which you um, can buy if you want after this, called uh, Designing the New American University. And uh, I learned an enormous amount from this book. I really admire it and uh, am eager to talk to Will about it. Well, thank it. you. Thank you for saying that. So <clears throat> I'm going to start out by first letting our um, you call for a new model of the American Research University, and I, I wonder for the audience who hasn't uh, read your book yet, uh, if you could describe what, you, what the, that model is of the um, new American Research University. Yeah. Well, the, the model is um, Michael Crow's vision, and uh, it's for an institution that combines um, highest levels of academic excellence, knowledge, uh, production, discovery, uh, with maximum accessibility and uh, maximum s social uh, outcomes. Um, the um, we we've he's likened it to, or it has been likened to, and we've accepted it to combining uh, UC levels of research excellence with Cal State accessibility in a, in a single institution. Um, so the, one of the main arguments behind this is that research universities, the set of research universities, and there are really only roughly 100 out of 5,000 colleges and universities in the United States, there are only really 108 uh, what the Carnegie Foundation terms RUVH institutions. You may be familiar with the term research extensive, they used to be called. And another second cohort of about 100 institutions that are less research extensive. Um, but these institutions are, have become increasingly uh, inaccessible. And uh, his vision was that the, these universities should not be accessible only to the top 5% of American students, or 10%, but to the uh, top 25%. And not only socioeconomically disadvantaged students, but students from the middle class, middle classes, uh, students who have differing indicators of creativity and intelligence. So it's, it's um, taking a, a fairly entrenched model uh, no one is surprised to hear any longer that Stanford accepted only the top 5% of uh, applicants for their class of 2019. Um, Harvard comes in at about 5%. Um, and Berkeley, uh, something like 7.8%. <clears throat> so the, um, the model calls for maximum levels of accessibility to uh, institutions that have academic platforms of knowledge production and discovery. Mm -hmm. So uh, you <clears throat> feel passionately, uh, um, as does Michael Crow, about access and the need to increase capacity, really, as you just said. 
Um, I think you told me at lunch that Arizona State University has 91,000 students. Am I re remembering that, that right? That, 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 that is true. And uh, that's uh, something like a 65% increase since he arrived. Uh, so there are 91,000 students. 20,000 of those are enrolled online. Um, of those 20,000, 4,000 are in the ASU Starbucks program. Yeah. That, that we discussed. So. Oh, that's what we were talking yes, about that. Right. And I was wondering, I'm, I'm sure many of you heard about uh, mm. ASU's offer that any uh, employee of Starbucks could, uh, could go to ASU free Online. of cost, right? Yes. Online. Um, but so a 65% increase, I didn't know that figure. That's huge. But since what, <clears throat> did Michael go in 2002? Since, 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 two? since 2002, yes, yeah. exactly. And... Um, the um, part part of the part of the s implications behind looking at scale and accessibility, scale of institutions, is uh, the the public value of an institution is in a sense very often determined by the fact that it serves the, its public adequately. So if the um, division of motor vehicles served only 100 people a day, but did it mm -hmm. very well, and, and all 100 people were very satisfied, but there were still 3,000 people waiting on the sidewalk at the end of the day who couldn't mm -hmm. get in the door. Uh -huh. Th that, that's, that detracts from its public value. Mm -hmm. And so um, <clears throat> it's, it's, a, it's a matter of size relative to the population that an institution serves. And his argument is, is that the set of research universities doesn't have the, doesn't offer the enrollment capacity. The uh, infrastructure of American higher education was largely developed through the uh, mid 20th century, and there have been uh, no new universities of any s scale to speak of, either public or private. Um, <clears throat> this is um, a complementary model. It's not in any way meant to. Uh, replace or uh, detract from the the, the accomplishments of uh, the set of American research universities. They're the uh, <clears throat> most um, sophisticated and complex institutions in, in, in the world. And uh, as Jonathan Cole, the provost emeritus at Columbia, uh, who's uh, written a, a really marvelous book called The, uh, the Great American mm -hmm. University, uh, came out in 2009. Um, Whenever he gives a talk, he begins by explaining or reminding people that research universities have multiple missions, that uh, they're, they're, they're not just institutions where you send your kids to school. I mean, they're, they're, they, they're responsible for discovery and innovation that's uh, improved the lives of uh, humanity worldwide, that drives uh, economic competitiveness. And so um, his, um, Michael Crow's argument has been that this set of institutions, at least some subset of this set of institutions, should assume the, take on the responsibility to expand their enrollment. <clears throat> and so actually um, almost, uh, I mean very recently, just as, as the, we were completing the book, um, Michael, uh, Chair is now chairing something called the University Innovation Alliance. And um, these are 11 large public research universities that, that have agreed to take on this, this mission of, of attempting to expand um, enrollment, specifically to socioeconomically disadvantaged or historically underrepresented students. But this includes uh, some, some AAU institutions like the University of Texas Austin, Ohio State, um, Oregon State, um, UC Riverside is uh, part of the uh, alliance. Mm -hmm. And so um, <clears throat> th th this is one outcome of, of his push to encourage um, to raise awareness and to encourage research universities to expand their their enrollment capacity, which which as 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 we were discussing earlier, I mean, is 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 a major 
is a you know significant challenge, of course. So, uh, so what are the challenges of doing this? I mean, I, that almost boggles my mind to think of increasing the size of an institution sixty-seven percent in little more than a decade. I, you were there the whole time. What were the most significant challenges in doing that? Uh, that's right. The enrollment growth. Um, I'm, I'm just looking at the figures here, reminding myself that the uh, enrollment growth has risen from fifty-five thousand students, undergraduate, graduate, and professional, in 2002 to the 91,557 now. So yeah. that, that is a 65% increase. Um, so degree production has increased uh, more than 78% mm -hmm. over, over this 12-year period. So ASU awarded 21,000 degrees during the previous academic year. It's awarded 100,000 degrees during the last six academic years. Uh, each uh, entering freshman cohort contains, e even, even though ASU admits, uh, we, we were, I was citing those figures for Stanford, 5%, Harvard, 5%, um, Berkeley, 7.8%. Um, ASU is, is admitting 80% of applicants. And for some reason, people hear that and they, they think, well, it's, it's open enrollment. But that's not remotely the case. Um, the, um, the academic requirements for these students, the, these, these are academically qualified Arizona residents. They're the same as what the University of California, uh, the standards that the University of California had in the 1950s and 1960s. So uh, students who were, uh, I mean, John Douglas has written extensively on mm -hmm. this, of course. Students who in California in the 50s and 60s who completed uh, a set of 10 required courses and maintained a 3.0 grade point average were essentially automatically admitted. And so um, uh, Michael Crow often remarks when he goes around speaking to um, different groups, business groups around the country, um, he will tell the CEOs and, 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 and uh, leaders of, of, of these corporations that you would not be admitted to the school where you were a student in the 70s or 80s because, because the admission standards have risen so, so to such an unprecedented extent. Uh, there's, you know, I mean, a number of factors are... are, well, are uh, though there certainly is some element of great inflation in that, too, isn't there? I'm sure there is. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> but what about, I'm really interested in what the challenges are for the university. I mean, you know, to, for a moment, yeah. let's say we all agree this is the single most important thing to do. What are the challenges in actually doing it? Well, the way, what, what ASU has done is to... Uh, adopt a, a much more flexible framework and to, if, if, to admit all, all qualified students uh, essentially means re, re, revamping and refurbishing the, the uh, existing infrastructure, um, seeking additional resources from uh, uh, creative collaborations with, mm -hmm. with business and industry, governments. Mm -hmm. um, it's, uh, it, 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 has, it has worked at ASU. It wouldn't obviously wouldn't necessarily work in other municipalities mm -hmm. um, and in other contexts, but I, I think w the success has shown that it is possible. Now, at the same time that uh, the enrollment growth has increased by 65%, the, 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 the academic profile of, of students is, is um, all indicators, SAT scores, um, uh, have, have increased dramatically as well. The, the number of um, academic awards the students receive, the Fulbrights, the um, uh, Truman Scholars, uh, across the board uh, have, have increased dramatically as well. Yeah, but what about, I mean, just when I think of scaling up at that level, I yeah. think of the physical facilities that would be um, important to build in a pretty short period of time. I think of all the faculty that would need to be hired. How did you handle those challenges in scaling up that fast? Well, the, the, uh, and, and at the same time that um, the 
university has scaled up the, uh, the through significant investment in research infrastructure the uh, research expenditures have have increased dramatically too uh, going going from um, by a factor of 3.5, going from 123 million to 425 million mm -hmm. dur during this period, w without a significant increase in the size of the faculty. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I think I think the answer to your question then is is that faculty who sign on are willing to take on additional teaching responsibilities. Mm -hmm. That that's become part of the uh, promotion and tenure criteria, mm -hmm. as well as public service. Mm -hmm. Um, and um, there's more, far more flexible use of the academic, of the uh, infrastructure that, that does exist. I mean, in terms of uh, semesters have been divided up into uh, three, three part units. So you have an A, B, and C, mm -hmm. and not all classes are necessarily uh, the, the full course of the semester. They might mm -hmm. just, they might just be se seven week or, f or 14 week. Um, mm -hmm. Units, uh, summer, summer, summer school enrollment, uh, and at the same time, uh, the degree production has dramatic become dramatically more efficient. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the cost the cost has come down per per student, so so that uh, ASU is actually one of the most um, efficient uh, producers of degreed students in in the country. Let's talk about another element of your vision, which is the, you describe variously as transdisciplinarity or interdisciplinarity. You argue that the university as it currently exists has design limitations, and you describe those design limitations as we're too, um, a too great a fixation on departments as representative of traditional academic disciplines, and in your imagination, yours and Michael Crow's imagination of this new American university, you think things should be far more, the word you keep using is transdisciplinary. Trans right. And could you talk a little bit about your conception of the transdiscipline, er, transdisciplinarity, I guess I would say, yeah. and, um, and how you achieve that? Well, I, I, I think the distinction that, 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 that some um, <clears throat> Theorists of interdisciplinarity like to make is is that transdisciplinarity implies also uh, uh, going outside the institution, collaborations with business, mm -hmm. industry, and government. Mm -hmm. um, but um, yeah, no, this 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 has been one of one of one of his uh, ob objectives from from the outset is is that uh, d uh, there's really no no need for disciplines to be departmentally based for, for this correlation that, that has been, that has existed since, um, well, that certainly became um, co codified in, in the 19th century yeah, right. with, with the emergence of the uh, American Research University out, out of the, uh, uh, its various antecedent institutional types like, the uh, well, most most prominently the German research university, uh, epitomized by the University of Berlin, Wilhelm von Humboldt's vision, um, and and the Oxbridge model. Uh, these these were Oxford and Cambridge uh, were were the, in a sense, the progenitors of the elite colonial colleges, and um, which became some of which became the Ivy League. Now, some, some of those elite colonial colleges evolved into major research universities, like Harvard. Uh, well, actually, they, they, they all are, for the most part. They all evolved. But in, in the next book that we're working on, um, we discuss these as, as the first wave of American higher education. So the, um, the schema for for that model would be that the first wave are the elite colonial colleges, the second wave were the early uh, regional and state universities, uh, the third wave were the land-grant universities that were established as a consequence of the Morrill Act in uh, 1862 that uh, Abraham Lincoln signed into law during the Civil War, um, and then the uh, American Research University, the fourth wave, is, is what um, 
is, is actually pinpointed to the, emerge, uh, the formation of Johns Hopkins in Baltimore in 1876 by, by the first president of the uh, University of California, uh, Daniel Coit Gilman, who left because of a, uh, apparently some difficulties with the legislature here. And um, so, so, so Johns Hopkins, in a sense, institutionalized the, the model of the American Research University. Then during the uh, period between 1876 and 1915, uh, 15, uh, th th this is per Roger Geiger. He's a historian of higher education at Penn, at Penn State. He's uh, sort of written the book on this. Um, 15 institutions, five public universities, five private, uh, the state flagships like Michigan, California, Berkeley, I mean California, Michigan, Wisconsin, um, Illinois, and then five privates, the, the Ivy League institutions, and then uh, institutions that were conceived from whole cloth by, um, as a result of, uh, Philanthropic endowments, Stanford, uh, University of Chicago, the, the, the Rockefellers got started that. Um, th these, uh, these institutions all set what, what Michael Crow terms the gold standard in American higher education. And um, the fifth wave is, is, is what he envisions to be the uh, emergence of the fourth wave institutions into what, what uh, might be termed super publics. So, so these are public research universities that take on this mission of, of uh, enrollment at, at scale to meet enrollment demand. Um, now, now the funny thing is, the, the first wave institutions like the elite colonial colleges, um, the, some of them still exist in that very form. I mean, uh, places like Bard and Bowdoin, mm -hmm. uh, they, 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 they still are, are very much what they were in the uh, early 19th century. And um, some of the second wave institutions that were institutions that were established as second wave, like the University of Virginia, um, that 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 has evolved into a fourth wave institution. Most of the uh, the flagship public universities that are were the land established that were land grants became fourth wave institutions. So so this is a vision for the uh, further evolution of the American Research University because uh, most people assume that the institution is, has reached its, I mean, it's, it's done. It's, as, he, as uh, Michael Crow always says, people just assume it's done and, and departments are done and, and what, 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 what more do you need? Um, part, part of the um, transdisciplinarity uh, objective is to also address um, what are always termed uh, the grand challenges, I mean, societal problems that, that cannot be addressed only from, through one discipline. I mean, you, 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 you have to have people from a dozen different disciplines working on some of these problems like climate change and poverty and uh, collapse of ecosystems. And uh, so uh, some of the transdisciplinary schools that, that he has established or, or, or led, led the establishment of, because very, this is very much faculty driven. I mean, this is, this is part of the model too. Is, is that um, he, he encourages the faculty to, to be creative, to, to self-organize, to form new collaborations and partnerships. So, so the School of Life Sciences was um, before that five or six different bio biology faculties. Um, what was anthropology became the School of Human Evolution and Social Change, which incorporates mm -hmm. Uh, a lot of uh, other uh, scholars from the social scientists and scholars from the social sciences. Um, the um, School of Historical, Philosophical, and Religious Studies that you remarked mm -hmm. on was, was three separate departments, and now they're, they're uh, uh, nominally in one, in one, one school. Um, so, and so, are the faculty all happy campers about this? <laughs> uh -huh. uh, surprisingly, for the most part. Uh -huh. I, I, I understand that there, there are, are, are uh, some, some people that complain, but uh, um, for, for the most part, uh, it, it, it has been uh, you know, a, a, a real success by all accounts. Mm -hmm. 
And um, do you have a College of Engineering, for example? What about the what? What was formerly the College of Engineering? Now, now this this is interesting. Uh, that has become uh, five uh, research-intensive schools. So, with with a uh, 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 gift from uh, Ira Fulton, they're, they're now termed the Ira Fulton Schools of Engineering. And so, there's, for example, a School of Sustainability and Sustainable Development, mm -hmm. uh, School of Computing and in Informatics. Uh, there, there, there are actually five five different schools that are each interdisciplinary or transdisciplinary, and then for students who don't plan to go to graduate school, but who have um, you know, every capacity to succeed professionally as engineers, there is on the um, Polytechnic campus a, a school that is basically focused on, on hands-on uh, study of engineering and wor workforce development. Um, this was even part of the flexible framework that you, you asked about. Mm -hmm. um, there are now four campuses, um, including mm -hmm. the new downtown campus, and uh, they're, they're meant to be clusters of similar uh, schools that work to, well together. So for example, the downtown campus is um, journalism, the Walter Cronkite School of Journalism, the, the, the law school is moving down there, public policy, the, uh, schools that would benefit from access to, to uh, uh, state, state and local governments. And, and you mean downtown Tempe or downtown, down, downtown Phoenix? Phoenix? Oh, mm -hmm. downtown Phoenix. F yes, yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, light rail connects the campuses. Mm -hmm. The um, what was formerly um, uh, just the um, uh, a campus out, uh, what, what became a campus that was a former uh, military air base in Mesa is now the Polytechnic campus and, mm -hmm. and the objective is to make it competitive with say Cal Poly. Um, and uh, there's, a, there's a West campus and they each have uh, unique clusters of, of schools and so that more flexible framework has also allowed for enrollment capacity. And do the students apply to particular campuses or do they just apply to ASU and they, then they, they find do. their home on a exactly. particular campus? Yes, exactly. That, that, that's one, one, one of his objectives, one of Michael Crow's objectives was, was not to have tiered campuses. Mm -hmm. Many satellite campuses are um, mm -hmm. you know, decidedly intended for students who aren't Academically qualified to go to the main campus, mm -hmm. and so here, <clears throat> the the degree simply states that it's a degree from Arizona State University. It doesn't mm -hmm. specify a campus. Yeah, I'm curious about the relationship with the state in all this. Did the state just say, "Go and do good, <laughs> you know, do this"? Did you have struggles with the state as you were? Because this sounds like a very significant change for ASU both in its development of its research portfolio, but also in this massive increase in enrollment. Yes. Did, did you run into any obstacles with the state? Well, I, I believe that um, the, uh, with the um, assistance of the Board of Regents, mm -hmm. uh, the, um, the legislature has generally been persuaded that um, it's a good thing that, that uh, the degrees are produced more, more efficiently, mm -hmm. and so um, they they have been uh, they have generally been supportive, I except of course uh, state state disinvestment uh, came about as a consequence of the uh, economic downturn, the Great Recession in two thousand eight. So funding was cut by something like forty five percent. It was it was the largest. Uh, uh, both in terms of percentage and, and in terms of just dollars of any university probably in the country. Yeah, and I guess uh, the president of the University of California was, for part of the period, she was the governor, right, that, that Michael that, Crow was dealing with, that, right. that they had a working relationship. Yes, yes, exactly. Yeah. Yes. I want to ask a question that what you were, what you were saying about transdisciplinary really bears on, and, and this is a question I think about often in relationship to Berkeley that we say often as just an article of faith that students benefit, undergraduate students benefit, get a, a unique benefit from 
going to a research intensive university um, better than uh, non-research, you know, a, a, a liberal arts college, the, the mm -hmm. Bards and the Bates <clears throat> and the Bowdens of the world. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I, but I don't know a lot of evidence that shows that that's the case. And I you're, wonder you're, what you're you, right. what, what, I, I'm really interested because one of the claims that your book makes, I think very interestingly, is that what you and Michael Crow believe is that these students that you're admitting to ASU deserve and are benefited by um, getting their education in a research intensive university. And yet I often think about some of the research intensive universities that I know with huge student bodies mm -hmm. that these students are taught many classes by graduate students or adjuncts. They sit in very big lecture classes. That exactly, the way yeah. in which we imagine um, research intensive experiences doesn't necessarily apply to every student that mm -hmm. sets foot on the campus. And I wonder if you could talk about no, that no, a little that's, bit. No, that's, no, that's, that's very true. <coughs> and, 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 and I'm sure that the educations that students receive in the uh, uh, top liberal arts colleges are, are just Fully, fully the, the 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 equivalent, but the the advantage is is possibly that in a, in a research grade environment, students are studying with faculty who are at the cusp of of knowledge. The 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 they're engaged in in the vanguard of knowledge production and and uh, innovation, and. Um, but 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 the the, stati the the statistical evidence the metrics to back that up uh, we're, we're still we're still looking for that as 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 well. Mm -hmm. I mean we we I mean certainly the the provost's office is measuring outcomes and we're looking at evidence from elsewhere. I mean ever ever since the Boyer report I suppose mm -hmm. in in uh, 1996, yeah. there 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 has been a push for research learning, but. Um, <clears throat> This is possibly somewhat t tangential, but uh, Kevin Carey, mm -hmm. who does higher, educa higher education policy at the New America Foundation, uh, had, a, had an interesting uh, uh, article, a column, where he said that when President Obama remarks that the United States has the, the greatest universities in the world, most people, when they hear that, assume that that means that, on average, American universities are the best in the world, and and that's 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 not actually what that's not actually the case. When when we when we if you say that we have the best universities in the world, it's because of the top research universities. Um, in the in the Shanghai rank uh, Shanghai Jiao Tong University does these world ranking academic ranking of world universities. That, that, that's uh, actually con considered very, uh, the methodology is very credible. Uh, 17 out of 20 of the world's top universities are American research universities. Uh, when the Times Higher Education does, does their rankings, it's, it's always at least 50, 14 out of 20 or 15 out of 20 are, are American research universities. But, but for many average students who have every potential to succeed academically, they, they don't get to study at the top 50 liberal arts colleges or, or the top research universities. <clears throat> and so in terms of scale and accessibility, if you take the, uh, all the students enrolled in the top 50 liberal arts colleges, they would fit inside of uh, Michigan Stadium. <laughs> so, so that's uh, Anthony Grafton, the historian Anthony Grafton pointed this out. Uh, let's, that's only 100,000 students out of 21 million students in the United States, 18.2 uh, million undergraduates. Uh, so there's, there's 100,000 students enrolled in the top 50 liberal arts colleges top 50 according to US News and World Report, but we, we can take that as a proxy for you know, excellence. And then, um, if, and then all the students in the Ivy Leagues, the eight institutions of the Ivy League, could fit inside of Yale Bowl. Mm -hmm. I mean, not, not quite, there'd be a little overflow, but, but close for rhetorical effect. Uh, so <clears throat> now, now that's 1% of American students. I mean, and 1% and one, one, 1 meant to evoke the outrage at the 1% the, the and the 99% 
in terms of economic terms. But, but so the 1% of American students attend the Ivy Leagues and the top 50 liberal arts colleges. If we take all of the um, top universities that belong to the AAU, which is the Association of American Universities, which are the 60, considered the 60 most prestigious universities in, in, in the US, that, that still only brings us to 5% of American students, between 5 and 6%. If you add all of the RUVH, the research extensive institutions to that, if you add the 108 that weren't counted in the uh, AAUs, that brings us to uh, 10 or 11% of American students. So the, uh, the argument, the, the scale and accessibility argument that, that, that Michael Crow makes is, is that we, we should have that kind of research grade education available to the maybe top 25% of American students because uh, the future of American innovation depends on it. Uh, the Center for the um, Workforce, Education in the Workforce mm -hmm. at Georgetown publishes, mm -hmm. uh, does uh, someone named Anthony Carnivale, does a lot of uh, reports on, the, um, on education, higher education in the workforce. They're projecting a shortfall of um, you know, th three million college educated workers by 2018. Uh, every, everything points to the need for more uh, edu higher education that brings students to competitive levels, uh, competitive levels for the global knowledge economy. And so um, that's, that's part of the motivation. Yeah. I'm going to ask you one more question, and then I'm going to throw it open to questions from the audience. But the, the question I have is about the online students. So. Let's accept for the moment that your argument is right about this research-intensive um, education for the students you admit. Are the online students getting the same experience? What about your, you know, um, uh, uh, d d you know, a, a Starbucks employee who's uh, who's getting her degree at uh, yeah. well, that, Arizona that's State? A, do they do they have the same benefit from that's, the research intensive that's university? A, that's a very that's a very good point, and 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 uh, we we should. Uh, uh, we should we should address that in in the in the, in the, in the next book more fully. Mm -hmm. But but the the idea is that the online students do have access to curricula that are prepared by ASU faculty. Um, certainly, there 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 I suppose the the number of research opportunities would would not be the same as for what 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 we term Im students in the immersive learning environment. Mm -hmm. But 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 insofar as possible, the uh, online students uh, degree programs are are not not meant to be diluted mm -hmm. in, in in any way. Mm -hmm. Well, <clears throat> for your questions, yes, Avi. about funding for this great expansion, except to say that there was this enormous cut in funding recently. Yeah. So I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about what the sources are for funding, and sort of in line with the old Carnegie Foundation um, issue, who pays, who benefits. Exactly. And, uh, and how this translates uh, into things like uh, the percentage of students who are outside the, uh, the, the state, the percentage of tenure track faculty, has that changed uh, in, recent, uh, in the recent decade? And, <clears throat> and those kind of related financial issues. Yeah, no, well, those, those, those are all uh, inter interrelated, certainly. And uh, what, um, what um, President Crow always points out is that, well, there are 17 revenue streams. I couldn't name them for you right now, but certainly the, the expansion of the research infrastructure has brought, has increased uh, uh, research, sponsored research funding, uh, uh, you know, going from 123 million to 425 million with the objective of bringing it to, to 700 million uh, by 2020. Uh, uh, partnerships with business and industry, with, with uh, local governments, uh, <clears throat> philanthropic support, uh, support from um, um, alumni, um, um, efficiency, finding efficiencies where they can be found. 
Um, the, the cost of degree production has, as I've mentioned, gone, you know, gone down dramatically. Um, so, so uh, yeah, it's a complex challenge, and um, uh, he thinks of this in terms of the concept of academic enterprise, that in the past, public universities very often viewed themselves as, as um, agencies rather than enterprises. They were agencies in the bureaucratic sense of uh, depending on public funding. So like the division of motor vehicles again, um, uh, root, routinization, standardization, uh, these, these, these were the hallmarks of, of agencies that saw themselves primarily in the service function of uh, producing undergraduates. And um, the, 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 the opposite of that would be uh, academic enterprise. So the, the, uh, the university views itself as an enterprise and enters into partnerships and, and, and seeks uh, first mover advantages with uh, creative technologies. And um, so it, it, uh, it, it, it is actually um, a model that demonstrably works at ASU. Mm -hmm. Yes, in the back. Um, so, okay, so I'll accept, I'll accept your premise that it's ridiculous that Stanford's accepting 5% of people and that there should be more access to that. But I don't quite understand the logistical model that you're proposing. So let's just take California as an example. You're basically, I think, proposing to increase enrollment at the UCs three, four, five-fold. <laughs> so basically, you're taking people who might be at the CSUs and moving them into the UC system. So why, why is the proposal to do that as opposed to make the CSUs more research intensive, better in some sense, or if, 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 turn CSU campuses <clears throat> into, C, into UC campuses, basically? Um, <clears throat> well, if that, if that were possible, all, all, all of those would, would be solutions, uh, partial solutions. But um, I, I think it's, it's just the, this is not intended to be a, a model that all institutions can or should seek to um, ad adopt. I mean, it, it, it is um, so, so, so something that some subset of public research universities should, should take on, and, and thus far 11 have, including, you know, as I said, UT Austin and uh, Ohio State. Um, it, it's, it's, um, it, it, it is a significant logistical challenge, and, and there, there, there might be other solutions as well. This is, this is just one, one possible model. The, the, uh, the idea is that there, there, there should be alternative frameworks for, for um, higher education. And um, insofar as possible, they, 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 they should bring students to levels of competitive levels of, um, of competence in terms of workforce demand, changing workforce demand in the uh, global knowledge economy. Yes. I really like your presentation. Oh, did you? Did you? Oh, did you want Hi, uh, to sorry, I'll you pass it on in a minute. Uh, thank you. First, thanks for coming. I'm not sure if this is going through, actually. A uh, couple questions. First, actually, first, I work here at Social Science Matrix, so I just uh, would be remiss if I didn't point out that um, this space that we're all in actually is was specifically established to be kind of a center for uh, transdisciplinary work across the social sciences. So this is kind of Berkeley's mini experiment in social science transdisciplinary re uh, research here. So just to just to point that out. Uh -huh. um, <clears throat> two quick questions, kind of unrelated. One is I'm curious to what extent you've attempted to engage the community, namely students, in this vision? In other words, if I were to stop the average ASU student and ask them, what is the new American university? Would they be aware of it? Have you attempted through communication to get everybody kind of tapped into this vision or is it more behind the scenes um, for the average you know, member of the community? And second, I'm curious to what extent the administration has been able to maintain remaining s centralized uh, as you've had these different campuses, as opposed to, you know, moving toward a more CSU-like network of institutions. Yeah. Well, to take to take your second question first. Um, yes. No. There there is no campus level governance. Uh, it's it it is uh, the largest public university in the country, governed by a single administration. Mm -hmm. So 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 the model 
is, is, is not to move to uh, auto semi-autonomous or autonomous campuses the way the UC system is set up. Or another model that, that we have looked at very closely is the University of London, which is um, comprised, uh, comprises 19 uh, institutions, some large, some small, University College London being the largest, King's College London, um, until they left after 100 years, Imperial College London, and then a lot of smaller, inst very spe more specialized uh, boutique institutions like uh, uh, the School of Tro Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, um, Academy, Royal Academy of Dramatic Arts, uh, Academy of uh, th smaller institutions that, that, that depend on the central governance of uh, what's, what's termed Senate House. And um, <clears throat> actually, <clears throat> you, you, you know, the former president or provost, I believe he was termed, or principal at University College London pointed out that uh, UCL does not depend in any way on the University of London Federation, but the Federation depends on UCL. Mm -hmm. So um, <clears throat> I, I became re more resonant suddenly. I don't know. Yes, if you did. <laughs> something happened. But and, and as far as far as uh, communicating the uh, vision to students. Um, is there, there was from the beginning of uh, the, the reconceptualization, what, 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 what in the book is always termed the reconceptualization or the design process, was, was very much meant to be um, a, a, shared, uh, a shared process with input from uh, all, all, all levels, uh, I mean all constituencies, uh, fa faculty, administration, faculty, students, staff, uh, the community, um, and um, it um, we we there's a, we have a chapter where we talk about design in terms of Herbert Simon, the the the, the polymath, uh, Herbert Simon, uh, his concept of the sciences of the artificial. So he talks about na the science of the natural being the natural world, but anything that's a human artifact including language or uh, urban agglomerations or farms or uh, even, even language itself is an artificial science. But there's no reason why designing an institution can't be as <clears throat> precise and um, rigorous a process as um, the scientific research. It's, it's just very often um, taken for granted that institutions are what they are and, and there's very uh, there's, there's insufficient effort to um, organize f uh, for specific purposes, to organize for research, to organize for uh, greater enrollment capacity, and so on. Thank you. <clears throat> hi. Oh, hi, my name is Andrew, and I really like what you're trying to do. Um, and I do have a question about these ideas about faculty teaching cutting edge research to students. Um, I really like the idea. Um, I was a student at UC Berkeley. I teach here. And um, one reason why I also came to UC Berkeley is because I wanted to be a part of that. And one thing that I noticed was that a lot of the faculty that I work with right now, a lot of the grad student instructors that I work with, a lot of their syllabi tend to be very static. And they do have a lot of like old knowledge or very canon, canonical knowledge. Um, and I do feel that there has been a lack of innovation. And my question is, like, how would you incentivize faculty to teach this cutting edge knowledge to students in equitable and accessible ways? Like, mm. would you focus on faculty development programs? Like, what types of um, mechanisms would you put in place? That, I, I, I suppose that, that would be, that would be a, 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 a serious challenge. I, I think, I think part, part of um, the solution is, is just encouraging the faculty to, to um, regard this as an opportunity to, to um, and, take on this challenge and to, uh, uh, as I said, self-organize and form new collabor collaborative uh, research, uh, innovative collaboration partnerships. And uh, so, um, but yeah, that, that, that would be a, uh, that's a very good question. Yeah. yeah. During this vast period of expansion, what has happened to your student to faculty ratio and what has happened to the faculty teaching loads? Well, well, the the faculty teaching loads have definitely increased, and uh, as I um, I 
believe that generally that's just considered part of the uh, part of the um, program is that if, if you're willing to be a member of the faculty there, you, you, you should be willing to take on additional course load. And as I said, that's part of the promotion and tenure criteria. Um, <clears throat> faculty student ratio. That, that's, that's an interesting question because we, we've never, um, I, I'd have to get back to you on, on, on that. Mm -hmm. but, but, but as you can imagine, uh, a, a good number a good number of classes are, are large classes, very large classes, and, uh, but the, um, the, the um, success of students uh, obviously you know, suggests that, that there are other ways to do it than to have a uh, five to one faculty ratio or 14 to one or um, whatever the most elite institutions boast. Yeah, Sean? Um, so uh, we in Ireland first heard of ASU through the article in Newsweek in 2008 where um, ASU was announced as this cutting edge with Dublin City University and others. And um, my question, I've got three short questions for you, but, but uh, to fill in the background of some of the people here, Dublin City University, as you, you're still in partnership with, um, yes. was trying the most radical experiment probably in university education ever. Um, essentially, uh, when there, you were talking about institutional models you were using, the institutional model that kept coming up when we got questions in Parliament was that the university had autonomous statutory responsibilities. That is, the law was that it should be outside the law. Um, uh, power was actually um, vested in a single CEO, a president. And the um, university took a case at the Supreme Court in Ireland asserting its right to summarily dismiss any senior academic without cause. So that's in 2009. Now, it, we, we fought and we won, but it made it much harder for us that you were getting all this publicity as this kind of extraordinary, innovative kind of thing. So I've got three short questions. The first is, to what extent have you been influenced by the um, travail of uh, Herr von Pronsinski at, at DCU? It ended, as you know, with him going to Scotland uh, yes. under a cloud. Um, the second one is, why not get the corporations to train the students? Why, why should the taxpayer have to train them, since we're just talking about jobs? Thirdly, the critical 0.1% uh, top students, do you think they're going to be drawn towards your model? So there are three questions, inst institutions, uh, corporations paying for this, and finally the very top students. Well, okay, we'll, we'll begin with the second one then, uh, because uh, the reason why we shouldn't uh, necessarily turn it over to corporations, although in some you know, instances that, that's, that's, a, that's a good possibility, but um, it, it, it's the fact that uh, research universities uh, like liberal arts colleges offer comprehensive degree programs that include the liberal arts. Um, we mount yet, uh, yet another defense of the liberal arts in, in, in the book because, of course, that's the very first thing that um, legislators want to cut or if, if, if uh, you know, well, we don't need a German program. We, we, don't, we don't need a program in, in Chinese. Uh, well, no one would say that anymore, but in, in the past, I mean, the University of Colorado eliminated its Chinese program when I was an undergraduate there. Um, so, um, well, it's just, it's just the mission. It's the mission of, 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 of uh, research universities and liberal arts colleges to, to offer this sort of uh, integrated liberal arts curriculum where you have general education requirements during the first two years and more specialized training for the last two or three years. Um, and corporations can't do that. Now, now, universities could work very much in tandem with corporations and, and I think that's something that uh, ASU is exploring. Um, but, but am I right in thinking, with, with respect, very quick follow-up, you did actually get rid of biology as a, as a separate entity, isn't this correct? Well, they're, they're, the, 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 the disciplines still exist, but they're all integrated in terms of the School of Life Sciences. So uh, the, the, the people who do EPOB or, or MCDB biology are all working together along with uh, ethicists and engineers and uh, computer science people. Uh, it, it's just, uh, I mean, again, this is, this is just more, more transdisciplinarity. So, um, 
<clears throat> but yes, I, I, do, I do know that, that uh, ASU was looking very closely at what Dublin City University was doing, and uh, um, I, I'd like to hear more about that. It, it ended rather badly, as you probably know. I, I've heard, yeah. yeah. What about the top 1.1%, the thir the, the, Sean's the top, third question? Oh, the top 1%, would they, would they, be, would they be? Well, uh, as, I, as I said, uh, as I mentioned, uh, every freshman cohort at ASU, uh, if it's 10,000 or 11,000 students, whatever, the, if we take the top 2,000, their academic profile uh, matches point by point the academic profile of students admitted to um, Columbia or Cornell or, 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 or Harvard uh, or, or Bowdoin, except ASU admits five cohorts, uh, five Bowdoin cohorts. And um, th they're, um, th th this, this is just part, partly a, a function, too, of, of accessibility. Uh, a lot of those students might not be uh, admitted to more, more highly selective schools that can only admit, that will only admit 5% of applicants. But you, you do have an honors college for those top a, admits, absolutely. don't you? Absolutely. The Barrett Honors College is, um, is, is, is very, very highly ranked. I mean, this is, this is part of what makes a, a, such a large university work is that, is that everything is residential learning communities. It's construed as residential learning communities. And there's no reason why size should be uh, a uh, detriment because, for example, the, um, the University of Toronto, which is um, a, uh, an AAU institution ranked often as one of the top 20 research universities in the world, uh, is larger than ASU. Or, or was on up until this last year, maybe. Uh, so, so uh, they're they're not size and and academic excellence are not mutually exclusive. I have one last question. Yes. I was just wondering what the cost of attendance was, for like in terms of this increase in enrollment, how much of that is coming from the actual students that are now enrolling? Well, um, because uh, there, there's the sticker price, but then there's what students actually pay. And um, Michael Crow believes that uh, an undergraduate education could, shouldn't cost more than a Toyota Corolla. <laughs> um, so, so, so even though the, the tuition has gone up, it's, it's, a, it's a model. In the past, the model was uh, low tuition, low financial aid. Whereas the cost has increased for students who can afford to pay, that, uh, tuition, that tuition money is set aside and, uh, and enables students who, who would not be able to attend. Uh, ASU has um, a very large proportion of students who are Pell Grant recipients. So the cost is about $26,000, let us say. Why, as a student, would I want to pay $26,000? Um, when I could just enroll in like edX, which is from like Harvard and MIT faculty for free. Right. Well, well, if 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 if, if the out if the outcomes w would work for you, I mean, I mean, I, be I believe they have a, a very uh, most of what I've heard. What I understand is that most of the students who do succeed uh, through MOOCs, through through programs like edX, uh, are are students with al who already have degrees. Uh, because the, the the levels of persistence are are are, are very low, uh, tuition and fees for in-state is uh, is actually uh, ten ten thousand one hundred fifty-seven. Uh, so so, but but that's the sticker price that that most students don't pay. Uh, ASU gave something like a billion dollars in financial was able to give something like a billion dollars in financial aid out last year. Uh, we, we have something called the President Obama Scholars Program that uh, guarantees that no academically qualified student uh, would be turned away because of lack of financial means. So um, <clears throat> Michael, President Crow's argument uh, in, in part is, is, is that <clears throat> institutions that pick the cream of the crop of socioeconomically disadvantaged students. I, I mean, th these, are, these are laudable efforts, but, but they don't address the problem of scale adequately. And in many, places, in, in many cases, you're, you're displacing, you're simply displacing a middle class or a wealthy student uh, by, by admitting a, a, socio, a, 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 a low income student, uh, because if, if, uh, if enrollment capacity doesn't expand, uh, 
you're, 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 you're not getting more students in there to, you know, become. I guess I'm just, I'm just trying to get at the, the cost of quality. You know, I think the, the first question was really interesting in terms of just like who pays for this level of efficiency. Um, and being a UC grad myself and also a Harvard grad, um, I can't say that the same quality of education I received 10 years ago at UC Santa Barbara exists today. But I can probably say that the CEOs in the room, I received the same quality of education at Harvard that they received in the 1600s or, or better. Um, so I'm just trying to sort of weigh the pros and cons. Well, 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 well the, the issue is would, 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 someone be, would, would someone be admitted today who, who just, just because of the fact that if only 5% of students are being admitted, I mean, many, many people, um, uh, in, as, as, I, as I mentioned, in the 50s and 60s, uh, UC would admit any student who had respectable grades, a 3.0 GPA. And, and it was practically free. Yeah, exactly. And um, I, um, th th this is just no longer the case. And, and so the, the argument for uh, this uh, new model would be that uh, the enrollment, a certain subset of institutions should admit students who are academically qualified. Thank you, so. yes. <laughs> thank you very much for coming. Let's well, yes, give thank a, you very much for coming. Let's give a yes, Thank you. <laughs>